Before we get kicked off, I want to take some time to discuss the significance of International Women's Day. Uh, by definition, International Women's Day is a global celebration of the economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. But for many, it has also become the spark that ignites conversations centered around gender equality, access to education, empowerment, and advocacy. And did mm -hmm. you know that globally women make up just 23% in national parliaments? Or that on average women earn 25 to 40% less than their male counterparts? Impactful sets like these are huge eye-openers and help reinforce the importance of being cognizant in our decision-making. From recruiting efforts to promotions to smaller pieces of our everyday lives like supporting women's voices and offering mentorship opportunities, we all play a crucial role in creating a culture that allows diverse individuals and perspectives to flourish. So as we head to the next slide, I'm gonna give a high level overview of our agenda and then pass things over to Angie Sheehan, who will introduce our International Women's Day speaker. Well, we've nearly made our way through our introduction already, um, and then we're gonna shift into our 30 minute keynote speech. And after our speaker has finished, we're gonna allow some time for questions. So if you guys uh, would like to you know, see any follow-ups, please either raise your hand or type in the comment section. Um, after that, we're gonna shift into our breakout sessions. And you'll notice we've allocated quite a bit of time for our breakout sessions today. And that was really intentionally done because we wanna create uh, you know, some dialect, really have some impactful conversations there. And we want everyone to be able to weigh in and share their thoughts and experiences. Um, and after we work our way through our breakout session, we're gonna come back together, answer any lingering questions, and then we'll finish with some closing remarks. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing screens and I'm gonna pass things over to Angie. I have the honor and the privilege to introduce our speaker. Uh, our keynote speaker is Josephine Thomas Hoyt and she's going to lead the session as Clara mentioned, is called Choose to Challenge. And as an African-American female who formed a really unique relationship with a, a, a co-mentorship with a Caucasian male, Josephine is gonna walk us through her journey of challenging bias in the workplace along with sharing her awesome career journey and how mentors played a role in her success and the importance of having allyship and diversity. Josephine is a Senior Vice President of Human Resources at HSA Commercial Real Estate in Chicago, and she's got over 30 years of experience in corporate leadership um, in a variety of industries, including retail, public accounting, software development, travel management, and manufacturing. Um, again, Josephine, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your um, story with us. And um, I'm now going to pass it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. I'd like to thank everybody for this opportunity to speak at your inaugural International Women's Day event with a focus on mentorship, diversity, and allyship. When Clara reached out to me in 2020, I was a bit blown away that my story at an International Women's Day event with another company had made an impact. You see, I was just an observer like you are today. But when the subject of mentorship came up, I mentioned in passing that my mentor is a white man. As you can see, I'm not a white man or a white woman for that matter. I guess it was an unusual coupling. So let me tell you a bit about how it came to be. One of the things I like to do pre-COVID was to attend focus groups. If you're not familiar with focus groups, I suggest you look into them. Because in addition to being paid to participate, you get to meet people who are similarly situated. What do I mean by this? Well, if you're invited to participate in a group about employee benefits, you might be sitting around a table with individuals who are also well-versed in employee benefits, but who are from different companies, different company sizes, different races, different genders. The goal is to provide market research or feedback to a company about a product or service they want to introduce to the market. Well, this particular evening, I went to a group, and when the group was called, myself and another person were told they had more than enough participants. You see, they tend to overbook purposely in case someone doesn't show up. They also pay you if you're not chosen. So that can be a bummer if you're really interested in the topic, but also a pleasant surprise if you've had a long day and you just wanna go home. But it was on this fateful evening that I met Doug. Doug also wasn't selected. In a brief conversation on the elevator, led to a shared cab ride to the train station. The conversation was pleasant. We realized we were in similar industries and similar positions, and we agreed to stay in touch. We exchanged business cards and went on our merry ways. 
Now, I've been to hundreds of focus groups and exchanged business cards many times, but usually the cards end up on a pile on my desk. Clearly, there are piles of business cards all over the city because I often didn't hear from other people either. But Doug emailed a few days later and we agreed to meet for lunch. Our first lunch was one of the liveliest I've had. We talked about HR, finance, IT, working for smaller companies, and our lives in general. It was a fun lunch and we knew that we could be great sounding boards and resources for each other. And we agreed to meet for lunch at least once a month. Well, fast forward almost 10 years later and pre-COVID, we continued to meet for lunch at least once a month and sometimes more if one of us was working on a problem or a project that the other could assist with or we just needed to get out of the office to clear our heads. You see, Doug is a CFO and he's got a strong finance and numbers background. I'm a senior VP of HR and IT, and I have a strong HR and IT background. We both work for smaller companies. We both wear many hats. It's our diversity of skills that also helps us help each other. If he has a challenging HR issue, for example, he reaches out to me. And if I have a challenging numbers issue, I reach out to him. This allows each of us to concentrate on what we do well and lend value to each other in the areas that are not our strong suits. This has worked well, we've both learned about areas that we otherwise wouldn't have taken the time to learn, or we would have relied on Professor Google or some other paid resource for. Since COVID, we chat several times a week. I'm working from home and he's still commuting and we continue to be resources for each other. Whether we're discussing PPP, PPE, FMLA, LTD, or any of another million acronyms that are popular in the HR industry, we've been invaluable to each other. But where I have found the most value in our relationship is our candor with each other. I'm not ashamed to admit that when I met Doug, I was struggling to understand where I fit at my company. And if I really wanted to stay there, I was beginning to feel that I was treading water and being one of a few minorities at the company and the only person of color in the leadership team was really beginning to take a toll. Actually, being one of a few minorities in the industry was beginning to take a toll. I was oftentimes the only person of color in internal meetings, meetings with vendors. I was often the only person of color or the only woman. And even in the focus groups I attended, the difference with the focus groups was I could escape after a few hours, go back to my regular life and really never see those people again. And I also was learning and meeting different people. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a spiritual person and I believe everything happens for a reason. My chance encounter with Doug came at just the right time. Again, I was becoming more aware of my color and even more aware of the color, the lack of it around me. This awareness magnified everything. An offhand comment, a meeting I wasn't invited to, an email with CCs that I didn't think were necessary, all became fodder for the story I was telling myself. And that story was I was being treated differently because I was black or because I was a woman. It made me increasingly upset. I would discuss the slights at lunch with Doug and he would listen attentively. And in his Doug-like way, he would challenge my assumptions that things were happening because I was black or a woman. He would give me examples of similar things that were happening to him. And over time, I began to realize that my assumptions that it was all happening because I was black or a woman turned into, it's happening because my departments are not revenue generators, but rather cost centers. It's happening because I'm a ready aim fire girl and the guy I report to was a fire, aim, ready guy. It was happening because I was comporting like a girl. Hmm, it was time to make changes. Who better to show me how to operate in this work world than Doug? You see, as a white man, approximately the same age as those I worked with, in a similar industry, in an entrepreneurial company, he was perfect. He was so much like those I was struggling to understand in more ways than one. My husband, a black man and a retired graphic artist, welcomed this new mentor because he could see that a shift was happening. He agreed it was a huge benefit to get an insider's perspective. Little did I know at the time that my chance encounter with Doug would change my life. I would literally share what was happening to me and what my knee-jerk response would be, and Doug would coach me into a different response when necessary, oftentimes a more man-like response. Now, my intent here isn't to generalize all men or to generalize in general, but rather to shine a light on some of the stereotypical ways that we behave because we were born a boy or a girl or raised a boy or a girl. One of the biggest changes for me was I had to learn to stop talking so much. 
Now, I don't know about the other ladies here, but I just can't stand silence when someone else is around. I'm an introvert, so I like silence, but not when others are around. Now, my husband, my sons, my grandson, they can go on an hours long road trip and not say a word and be perfectly content. I, on the other hand, with my daughters, my daughters-in-law, my granddaughters, I'm a cacophony of sounds. I can't shut up. I have to fill the space. But I digress. Doug taught me to just be quiet after any ask that was important to me. If I wanted a bigger bonus, make my case, sit there and be quiet. Don't fill the space. Don't get nervous and start talking. If I wanted a bigger bonus or anything for someone else, make my case, sit there and be quiet. I have to tell you, my tongue was raw from biting it. The end results made that tongue, raw tongue, worth it. Doug's instructions about not filling the quiet space was driven home when I heard a keynote speech by Mika Brzezinski at an annual HR conference, where she drove home the point that there are huge differences in how we should comport, or how we comport as men and women, and how if we choose to challenge, we can change our lives. Mika talked about being a co-host on the Morning Joe Show. And when it came time to negotiate contracts, she watched her co-host, Joe Scarborough, literally negotiate with F-bombs aplenty. No apologies. She was mortified. Oftentimes, the calls were taking place on his mobile phone, so she overheard everything. She's like, there's no way he's going to be effective. She'd go home and talk to her friends and say, there's no way this guy is going to be effective. Well, he was effective. And he successfully negotiated a contract that was 14 times more in dollars than Mika's. We're talking millions of dollars. Mika said when she walked into her negotiations, she walked in with baggage. Joe walked in with facts. At the conference, Mika made some points that resonated with me. Now, I believe you guys all have an email or a handout that has these tips on it, but I'm going to go over them with you. Mika said women need to get over being grateful to have a job. Know what you bring to the table. She gave seven tips that can be useful in negotiating salary or just walking through the world in general. Number one, stop apologizing. Don't say you're sorry when there isn't a reason to be sorry. You know, oftentimes we'll walk into a meeting or something. Oh, sorry, you know, sorry. That's really not how we should comport. Only apologize when it's necessary. Number two, learn to press the reset button. Stop thinking about previous encounters. Walk in with a clean slate. She said, guys, again, not generalizing, but they tend to just walk into meetings and encounters with a clean slate. They don't think about everything that's happened previously. Women, we tend to do that. We think about the last encounter and we bring that in as baggage. Number three, don't play the victim. Don't divulge issues. Now, this is one of Doug's favorites and I'll share more on that later. She says, hold back and be reserved and elegant. Leave them wanting more. Don't talk about, I need a raise because I need more money because, you know, I, I get my hair done once a week and the guys don't. I need a new wardrobe. I, I need to get a, a better babysitter. Those things are personal, which leads to number four. She says it's not personal. It's business. Number five, don't worry about being friends. Get respect first. As women, we are congenial. We love to chat and talk and make friends. That's great but get respect first, she says. Number six, don't forget the power of the awkward silence. Again, one of Doug's favorites. She said, shut your mouth. Number seven, don't act like Joe with the F-bombs. It's not a good look. I, over time, have found these tips to be very helpful. I hope you will too. And Mika has two books. They should also be on your handout. Know Your Value and Grow Your Value. I often refer team members to these books when they're struggling, in particular, the women in my organization who are trying to figure out how to ask for a raise, what to do next, where they fit in the organization. I think these books are invaluable. Now, back to my mentorship with Doug. My conversations with Doug opened my eyes to the prospect that things happening to me were also happening to him. And they weren't always because I was black or a woman. From his vantage point, they were hardly ever because I was black. This would prove valuable and invaluable to me. It would prove helpful and harmful to me. Helpful because I had a new lens to look through and harmful because I lost the connection with my own intuition. Now, don't get me wrong. My conversion didn't happen overnight. I'm no pushover. So it took several lunches and phone calls and lots of pushback before I removed the chip on my shoulder. 
You see, I didn't think I had a chip until Jug just came out one day and said, you've got a chip on your shoulder. What? This candor took me aback, but it also opened my eyes. No one had ever called me on this. I recall telling him the next day that I was forever changed. He didn't believe that a black woman could have such a profound change in perspective for the better based on the conversation with a white man. But you see, I trusted Doug. He's consistent, he's steady, he doesn't waffle. These are traits that are hugely important to me and that I didn't always see from the white men I encountered on a daily basis. But Doug pulled back the curtain and he exposed a chip for me. And once the light hits something, I can never go back. Surprisingly, I wasn't offended. It was more like a doing the light bulb went on. He shone a light on something that was huge for me. After one particularly upsetting event in the workplace that literally brought me to my knees, I realized though that my conversations with Doug had made me so less sensitive to the microaggressions and biases that I had let my guard down. This hateful encounter devastated me in a way that it wouldn't have had I had my proverbial chip on my shoulder because I forgot that that chip had a bit of intuition in it. Doug and I had worked so hard at removing it that I forgot that parts of it were necessary for my survival, necessary to keep my shoulders balanced and my head upright, so to speak. The chip made me cautious when I needed to be. You see, that chip with a bit of intuition in it, I had laid it aside. While that upsetting event is one I won't ever forget, it also helped me to write my ship and course correct. So there are a couple of lessons here. Intuition is critical. And while a mentor can be invaluable, don't lose your entire self in the process of becoming someone better. Choose to challenge your beliefs and those of others when appropriate. When you have a visceral reaction to something, count to 10. Take the proverbial 10 seconds to challenge that feeling, to make sure your reaction is coming from the right place, that your reaction isn't based on something that happened to you or a belief that you've held about a particular thing for a long time. In other words, an implicit bias which is really an automatic pattern of thinking. That's what I had when I thought things were happening to me because I was black or because I was a woman. I wasn't even aware of them until I talked to someone who was having similar issues and he wasn't a woman and he wasn't black. Doug, now what? For too long, we've looked at implicit biases as a bad thing. And if you ask someone about them, they deny them because we hold ourselves to a higher standard. And after all, they are unconscious beliefs. When challenged, we say there is no way I think or feel that way. However, we are all shaped by how we are raised or who raised us, what we were taught, how we've been treated. These things shape how we walk through the world. In addition, we now have access to everything happening around the world in an endless cycle of 24 seven news. There is no way that we can watch it and not be affected by it. Triggered by it one way or another, triggered to action or triggered to indifference. In my role as an HR professional, I have a front row seat to all types of bias in the workplace. When it comes to hiring, I've seen candidates who were instantly moved to the top of the pile because they went to a particular school or in a particular organization. They're a friend of someone or a family member, or they're a friend of a great employee. This is affinity bias. Affinity bias is one of the most common recruitment biases. It occurs when people show a preference or a bias towards candidates who are similar to them. So I'm choosing to challenge you. If you are a hiring manager and everyone in your department looks like you, for your next hire, think outside the box that you've put yourself and your department in. Choose to challenge. Is there a candidate who has the skill set, but you're just not sure how to work with someone who isn't exactly like you or who didn't attend the same school as you or who doesn't share the same interest as you? or who doesn't look like you. Diverse teams bring diverse diversity of thoughts. A Harvard Business Review article entitled Why Diverse Teams Are Smarter stated that diverse groups focus more on facts. They process those facts more carefully and they are more innovative. Doug and I talk all the time about how many societal problems we could solve because of our unique perspectives. The article in Harvard Business Review went on to say, Working with people who are different from you may challenge your brain to overcome its stale ways of thinking and sharpen its performance. Diverse teams are more likely to constantly re-examine facts and remain objective. 
They may also encourage greater scrutiny of each member's actions, keeping their joint cognitive resources sharp and vigilant. By breaking up workplace sameness, you can allow your employees to become more aware of their potential biases, their entrenched ways of thinking that can otherwise blind them to key information and even lead them to make errors in decision-making. I'll give you an example. In my company, we have one department of 10 that has eight team members who are the same ethnicity as the manager. They speak the same language, eat the same food, socialize in the same ways. Many of the team members were referred by others on the team. Some are actually family members. It was one big happy family. One of the two team members who wasn't of the same background took another job. We had an opening. The best qualified person happened to be of another ethnicity. There was a ton of him and hawing on my part when asked my opinion between this candidate and another who was more of the same. I chose to challenge. It was clear to me in my interview that the newcomer, this person was different. If selected, she would challenge the status quo. I was not shy about this and I knew we needed the diversity and so I told the manager, I chose to challenge, that we should hire this person. And I said, she's going to challenge you. The manager said she could handle it. We made the hire and it was clear pretty quickly that the manager was struggling to understand this new bird. And the new bird was not accustomed to being fed the way the manager was accustomed to feeding her flock. It wasn't long before the manager produced a write-up that quickly spun out of control. The manager's implicit biases precluded her from questioning the motives of a person who raised what would be a false accusation against the new bird. I had to step in. Accusations were made, voices were raised, feelings were hurt. And at the end of the day, the write-up was torn in pieces and it was time to heal. I tell you, it was a tough time. Now your knee-jerk reaction might be, who needs that? Why introduce differences that will cause conflict? Both the manager and the new bird were so frustrated they were ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Could this relationship be saved? I'm happy to report that it could be. There were a few instances of misunderstanding and then intervention by me. Was it exhausting? Yes. Was it worth it? Yes. You see, the new bird had a style that was antithetical to the style of the manager and others in the department. The new bird questioned outdated processes and practices. She questioned why certain team members were allowed to behave poorly. She questioned why the rules were different for some. She questioned why we were continuing to do things in an antiquated manner. She questioned why delays had become the norm. She questioned almost everything, why we were being inefficient in how we were doing things. She chose to challenge and the department and the company were better for it. Like the Harvard Business Review article said, she constantly re-examined the facts and this shift caused a shift in perspective for many, myself included. Was I nervous when I made the recommendation to select her? Absolutely. I knew she would challenge the status quo. I knew this would be more work for me, but I also knew the company would reap the benefits. She was different than others in the department, but just what the department needed. What is mind blowing to me? as I was able to use some of the lessons that Doug taught me with this newcomer. You see, like me, she had a chip on her shoulder and oftentimes would say that things were happening to her because she was a woman or she wasn't like the others in the department because she wasn't going to accept antiquated practices and inefficient ways of doing things. While my HR training would allow me to dispel her assumptions when necessary, it was my mentoring from Doug that allowed me to see things from a different perspective. I didn't feel hypocritical when I would ask if she was seeing things from the lens that was fogged because of the first incident with the manager, when the manager chose someone else's side. When I asked her to choose to challenge her assumptions, she always gets it right. It's one of my greatest joys when she says, thank you for being my Wusa coach, the person who calms me down and helps me to see things from a different perspective. When she says, there was a time I would have found a different company to work for. Just last week, she said, thank you for helping me grow. That's powerful, right? Each one, teach one. What I know for sure is she will now choose to challenge her assumptions and she will teach someone to challenge their assumptions. And before you know it, many minds and hearts and companies and bottom lines will be changed. 
diversity is a good thing. Diversity of thought is excellent. So that's what I have on diversity. But one of the other topics I want to touch on briefly is allyship. In preparing for this presentation, I reached out to Doug. I was so excited about the opportunity. So was he until I told him the topic was diversity and allyship. He got the diversity part, but when I explained allyship, he instantly bristled. I knew he would. I actually read the definition to him. You see, Doug has this thing about not being a victim. He believes a cry for justice is the cry of a victim. He doesn't see himself as an ally in that he doesn't believe he's in an in-group and that I'm not. Are you shocked by this? I'm not. The definition of allyship is the practice of emphasizing social justice, inclusion, and human rights by members of an in-group to advance the interest of an oppressed or marginalized outgroup. Doug does not think I'm oppressed. How could I be? We are at similar places in our lives. We own nice homes. We drive nice cars. We earn a great living. And besides, he's shown me that the things that happened to me also happened to him. Isn't that equal? He believes our experiences are the same. Our last encounter, our last conversation about this made me remember a recent conversation that made it oh so obvious that we can experience an identical event and yet walk away with completely different memories of it. It was actually a phone conversation with my brother a few days ago. You see, our mom passed away when I was 12 and my brother was 14. And what I remember the most about her passing is walking into the funeral home and smelling roses. To this day, when I smell roses, I'm instantly transported back to that funeral home and I can see myself walking in. Well, much to my surprise, the other night, my brother mentioned in passing. Now, mind you, we have never discussed this, but he mentioned in passing that what he remembers the most about our mother's passing is the strong smell of lemons when he walked in the funeral home. Lemons? Lemons? That's what I said to him. Lemons? My mind was blown. We walked in at the same time, yet our experience was totally different. I'm a glass half full girl. My brother is a glass half empty guy. I wonder now if the smell of roses or lemons has anything to do with that. Does he smell lemons because the moment was sour? Did I smell roses because that's what I saw in the room? We may never know for sure, but what I do know for sure is we experience moments based on many factors. Let's be cognizant of this, cognizant of this, when we make our choices and our judgments about our experiences of each other and the things around us. Back to mentorship, allyship. Interesting, right? That Doug sees us and our experiences as equal. That whenever I correctly identify the cause of a microaggression is because I'm a woman or because I'm black, he sees that as playing the victim card. One friend has asked me several times, how can he be a mentor and ally? Really, if he feels this way? My response is he is a mentor and an ally, but he doesn't practice allyship. What? There is a difference between being an ally and practicing allyship. Let me give you an example. During our recent house hunt, my husband and I encountered all manner of racist behavior, some subtle and some not so subtle. It was during this time that my realtor and friend, who just happens to be a white woman, witnessed a vicious verbal attack on my husband and our electrician by a caretaker of a property that we were having inspected. I will never forget the day I called her to say we were canceling the contract and she was sobbing uncontrollably. Her words to me were, I get it, I get it. I now know what it feels like to be treated poorly because of the color of your skin. She said, I don't think I will ever get over it. She took it a step further and she wanted to file a formal complaint and was willing to put her reputation and her license on the line to stand up for me and my husband. She hit many roadblocks because many of the people she reached out to asked her, how did she know it was because we were black? And her response of, I just know you had to be there was met with skepticism. The only ally she found was another realtor who had recently met me and my husband. And so she was able to humanize us while the others looked away. I literally begged my friend and ally not to go to bat for us because we had already decided to walk away. 
And I knew her allyship could jeopardize her future with those who thought she was overreacting. Further, I explained, this isn't new behavior for us. And while we were devastated, we weren't surprised. There was no way we would feel comfortable living in a home where we knew we weren't wanted. While I made the call to stop her allyship, what is most touching to me is she was willing to put her career on the line for me. That was enough for me. You see, allyship is an action word, a verb. Are you an ally? Or do you practice allyship? Have you watched behavior that you thought was questionable and remained silent about it or talked about it in a safe space instead of the real space where it was happening? Some of us are born to be allies and we've mastered allyship. I would say that's me. I, I remember watching a classmate in elementary school get teased for stuttering. And my little seven-year-old self stood up and defended him. Not once did I think about the consequences, other than the consequence that he felt protected and shielded. I have walked through my life defending the defenseless. I honestly believe that's one of the reasons I chose HR as my profession. So in closing, I'd like to ask, can you be an ally and practice allyship? Have you listened to an off-color joke and laughed or remained silent? Have you watched someone bullied in a meeting who was silenced by the bully in the room? Have you been in a meeting and been charged with hiring and being asked to make sure it wasn't a person of color or a woman or someone in another protected class? Does the mention of protected class cause you to bristle? As I mentioned earlier, our access to 24 seven news coverage has put civil, social and political unrest in our faces in a way unlike ever before. Wherever you stand on the issues of the day, all I ask is that you stop looking at our differences to find what divides us, but rather look at our similarities to determine what unites us. Choose to challenge yourself and your biases. We all have them. It's what we choose to do with them that will either separate or divide us. I choose roses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josephine, so much for sharing your story, um, mm -hmm. you know, really and challenging us on how to familiarize ourselves with and challenge ourselves on uh, biases. So team, we're going to open ourselves up right now to questions from the audience. If you have a question for Josephine, please either raise your hand and I'll unmute you or unmute yourself or uh, send your questions in the meeting chat. So, uh, Josephine, we have a question in queue for you. Um, so you gave some great advice to women on incorporating um, some behavioral changes. Can you share a few tips for men and how they can be more conscious in supporting or empowering women? And, um, or if not, on the opposed, how can they not contribute towards the biases uh, to women, which you mentioned? I think it's important for men to be observant and to watch the room, as I like to say. So if you're in a meeting, as I mentioned, and you see a behavior that even as a man, it causes you to bristle or makes you uncomfortable that you find a way to call it out. And it may not be a, you know, hey, don't do that kind of a thing, but more of a subtle thing, you know, putting yourself in between that woman and that man, right, to stop that. And if there are biases that you're seeing coming towards you as a man, I like to address things head on, right, and to think about where am I right now in this moment? Am I reacting because of something that happened in the past or something that you know, I'm thinking about that's going to happen, anticipating some awful behavior? But I think it's just really learning to speak up and using your voice and not being afraid to say, mm, I'm going to call you on that or that's not you know, exactly how that went or not being afraid to be the voice, the ally who practices allyship. And, you know, and oftentimes you can go in and say, you know, maybe this isn't my place, but I just didn't like the way things just happened in that meeting. So I think there is a way to do it and to do it in a way that doesn't get you in trouble. I hope that answered the question. Oh, you're on mute. I think that was an awesome response. Are there any other questions for Josephine? Yeah, I'll ask a question. I, I Josephine, this is Angie. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, when you're, and, and I love the fact that, you know, the way you handled the comment, you have a chip on your shoulder was 
was one of kind of receiving that comment and really thinking about it because I think in that situation, I think a lot of us would be like, hold right? on a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, because, you know, a lot of times people will, you know, you kind of, you kind of um, think like, oh, okay, if, if someone's accusing you of that, right. Um, it's almost like it's, it's, you know, are you you can interpret it? Hey, they're deflecting on me, right? They're they're kind of using that as an excuse. It's it's not it's not the people around me. It's it's you. How did you like? What was your thought process as you kind of received that that feedback or received that piece of of advice? How did you get over that initial? Def I mean, did you feel an initial defense? How did you get over that? I think what's, as I mentioned, for me, I wasn't defensive, surprisingly, but I think it was because I trusted Doug. And we had many, many months of talking and sharing, and, and I felt as though he had my back, and I didn't think that there was anything that he would say to me that would be hurtful to me. So when he said it, it was that level of trust that made me accept it, and it was an instant acceptance. It was, it blew my mind. Because again, no one had ever called me on it. And he was like, you've got a chip on your shoulder, right? And I, I remember where we were sitting. I remember exactly when it happened. And I remember moving back and saying, wow, out loud, wow. And I stopped and I went inside really quickly to analyze it. It's like, whoa. And I literally, there's no other way to explain it, but like it was a tape that was in my head and I ran it back from the very beginning of my career. And I realized that he was so right. And then I thought, gosh, you know, I'm a senior VP of HR. How much further along could I be had I known I had a chip 10 years ago? It was mind blowing. He and I actually laughed about that now. He's like, maybe you could have been the president, you know, but honestly, it was the trust factor that allowed me to really be open and I think in a way he had groomed me for it because I trusted him. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, understanding the source and the intent on feedback is so important, right? Because Absolutely. you immediately, instead of hearing those words, you immediately went instead from to who's telling. It was almost, it, to me, it's like you're saying you almost immediately went to who's telling me this. Absolutely. Versus what are they saying? Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Really, really good piece of advice for all of us. Thank you. All right. So we have one more question, Josephine, so far. So um, who is the best person? Hold on. Let me pull this up. Who is the best person to lean on in times of um, adversity if you don't have a trusted advisor or mentor? Oh gosh, for for me, my first place, I'll be honest, is prayer. I pray and I pray for guidance and I pray for God to put people in my path that will show me what my next step should be. And even now, Doug and I, I say it to him all the time. I believe that our encounter was divinely led, that he was put in my path, that he's an answered prayer that he's an angel as one of my friends has said. So for me, that's where I go first is I pray about it. I ask God for guidance and I ask him to put the people, places and things in my path that will help me to grow. So for those on the call who maybe not have that stronger, you know, religious affiliation, uh, where would you advise them to go if they don't feel as if they have a mentor or a voice that can really lead them through a difficult situation? I think it's really getting introspective. I, for years, have read self-help books, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, because my mom died when I was really young. I had to parent myself, right? So I think part of it is parenting yourself and finding books that will give you guidance on how to move forward and how to grow so that you can become self-reliant, but again, so that you can find people who are safe and to know, you know, who they are when you encounter them. You know, I'm a huge Ian Lavanzant 
fan. You know, I've read almost every single book that she's written. Probably the most powerful for me was Peace from Broken Pieces, which kind of talks about our pathology, right? And if we don't have people that we can lean on, how we can move forward and parent ourselves and mentor ourselves until we can find the people that can make a difference in our lives. But I think it's important to become whole, for lack of a better word, first, so that you can recognize when the angels cross your path. Absolutely. So we are going to now shift guys into our breakout session. So I'm going to go ahead and enter questions in the chat. So they should follow you um, along into our meeting. So we have three questions. Uh, what challenges do you face as an ally or by not having an ally? Um, do you have an example of when you experience allyship in a meeting or work setting? And uh, how can you become a better ally? We're going to start off with these uh, with these questions. And, you know, what do they really mean to you? Um, so again, those are in the chat. So anybody who would like to participate, please do. Um, I, let's start off with number one, the key piece, awareness. So what challenges do you face either by being an ally or by not having an ally? Feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. I mean, for me, allyship is a totally new concept in the last 12 months. And so being cognizant of what it is has made me evaluate the relationships that I have with my coworkers and, and prior coworkers and really made me realize, um, you know, who they were and how they challenged me and how they guided me. And if I hadn't had those opportunities for that, um, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. So hugely important. I think from an allyship standpoint, sometimes there's the fear that you're the only one that, like if it becomes you always being the person to stand up for that sort of thing, that you kind of earn the reputation as being difficult. And I think that's where I struggle sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Claire, this is Sharon Langley. Um, I think there's an element of trust, right? So Absolutely. that's where the personal comes in with the professional, you know, and, and I remember uh, because I entered the workforce after I decided to take myself out for a while, it was, it was a different experience because you didn't know it was uncharted territory, right? I mean, who, I always assumed I trusted everyone, which was a big mistake, <laughs> but um, I think that's an important element. Mm -hmm. It's Josephine. I also, I agree that oftentimes if you open your mouth and if you're the one who's always being vocal, that you can get a reputation. So what I have found is I will often take the bully or the person who's being overbearing or the person who isn't practicing diversity or those things that I would like to see. I take them aside and I do it one-on-one -on -one and then when we go into another meeting, I often will see them looking at me like, am I doing it okay? And am I getting it right this time? Or sometimes I will have a code word with them or a signal, a little thing that I might do that says, you know, you're doing that thing again. So I think it's building trust there and, and having them know that you have their best interests at heart as well. So it, it is um, establishing relationships. It's really about trust. I could not agree with you more. This is Angie. Um, that that it, I, I'll tell you, early in my career, it was really hard to do that, right? Um, I need to make sure I fit in with the guys, which is why I kind of have a truck driver mouth, which most people know, which I, I work hard to control, but not always successful. But but that was the thing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to, you know, look like the one that I don't want everyone to know I'm the only one in the room. So I'm going to act like everyone else in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, as you get a little bit older and a little bit wiser and times certainly have changed, it really gives you, um, especially for myself, like it, it, it shines a light on the responsibility of of speaking up and the responsibility that little things can make a big difference um and so it def I, I know 
how uncomfortable it can be to to challenge some of that. And Kelly, I completely appreciate that. And and Josephine, I think you're right. That's why having relationships at work is so important. And I've talked about this a lot with my friends and, and colleagues outside of the company because a lot of people don't necessarily see it that way. And, and you know, hey, I'm there to work. I'm there to do a job. I don't have to win anyone over. Um, you know, this isn't a, it's not a fraternity. It's not a sorority. It's, it's a workplace. But when you have, when you put a lot of effort into creating those relationships, you also put a lot of effort in, you know, that, that goes a long way in terms of understanding. It goes a long way in terms of having difficult conversations, whether it's about, you know, something like what we're talking about today or just a work issue. Um, it, it opens up a lot of doors and gives you a lot more permission to have difficult conversations and maybe not in the public setting, but what can you what can you even do behind the scenes? Um, and I've seen a lot of people, have, you know, do a really good job about creating those effective relationships, but maybe not capitalize on them, you know, as much as we could, because, you know, when you have those relationships with people and you've created trust, you do get your, you get, you give yourself a little bit of, you know, leeway in terms of how, how much you can push the conversation and what those conversations look like that might not be always pleasant. Um, so just my two cents there, because I've definitely, in my career, I've come full circle on this from I'm not saying anything. I don't want anyone to even know I'm a woman um, to, you know, to, hey, if I create those relationships with people, I give myself a little bit more freedom to to point some of those things out and make small changes. But I also think it's important to remember that even culturally, sometimes we don't make relationships. You know, I grew up in a family where I was told don't mix business with pleasure. You know, don't go and hang out with people that you work with. It's not a good look. And so over time, I've learned that maybe that's not entirely true. You know, you can go out and hang out with people that you work with. Just don't stand on the bar, you know, and twirl your bra over your head, you know, but that wasn't clear to me growing up. It was, you don't mix business with pleasure. So early on in my career, I wouldn't go and hang out. You know, if I was invited to something after work, I'd say no. And in talking to friends now, as I've aged, a lot of my peers were taught the same thing. So I think it's also important to remember the diversity of culture, right? And what we're taught. So if I don't go out and hang out with you after work, maybe don't necessarily judge me for that. Maybe think about, hmm, I wonder, now you can think about this. I wonder if like Josephine, she was taught that you don't mix business with pleasure. You know, the young lady that I mentioned when I was talking about the difference, um, she's not someone who goes and hangs out, you know, with her department. And oftentimes that can be seen as you're being antisocial. But like me, even though she's a different generation, she was also taught you don't mix business with pleasure. But I think as you get to know people, you'll start talking about that, right? Like, you know, I would love to go out, but my mom, I mean, I'm 58 years old and I think about things that my grandmother told me and my mother told me. And while they may be antiquated, it's how I walked through the world for a very long time. So I think it's really taking into account that there is diversity of culture and thought and gender and all of those things before making a judgment call about why someone may or may not do something. Um, hi, Josephine, I'm Stacy. Um, first of all, excellent topic and, and presentation. You know, I'm kind of, I'm over here um, stewing about it a little bit because I, I think we're far from progressed on some of these topics. I'm, I'm with Kelly. I have always been in a male dominated industry and frequently the only girl in the room. Um, and I think it's situational. I think having allies, I've had allies throughout my career, someone to coach and and um, to give advice to in terms of progression, but but pretty consistently and even, even recently, I mean, you just, you kind of do have to check yourself at the door. You know, um, I don't know that we're quite there yet, um, and and have to be conscientious of it. So it 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 gives me. I love that we're having the conversation. I think it's a super healthy awareness conversation for both men and women at the company. 
Um, but it's there's a long road, and this is one of which will hopefully be many conversations. But as a woman, you get labeled so quickly um, as aggressive or defensive or talkative or emotional, or you can go through all that, and a guy can be in the room and almost have the same message or whatever. That hasn't changed, and unfortunately, um, you know, in reviews and everything, I mean, that's what comes back is you're still naturally inclined to certain behaviors and that kind of thing. So I just, I, I'm super self-aware and I get it. I love the conversation. I hope it continues, but I totally get from both Angie's comments as coming full circle and not being as conscientious about it and then advocating, but then on Kelly's side, still having that self-check constantly. So but yeah. thank you. Great topic. No, I think, yes, yeah, Stacey, I think that's a really, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask Josephine this question because I was thinking about a lot of this when you were speaking. How do you, how do you, like, what advice would you give? Like when you try to talk about meeting Doug in the middle and he has the same experiences, like, you know, as I mentioned earlier in my career, I just was like, hey, I'm not a woman. Don't, don't, don't label me as that. Like, I'm just one of you. But how do you how do you kind of embrace your differences without like you know you you you've you've had a relationship with Doug and he's kind of pointed out where your sameness is but there's there's differences so how do you how do you get to the sameness without giving up your differences do, do you know what I mean I do and I think that's where I went back and I talked about the chip on my shoulder and losing myself right like I I was so intent on becoming more Doug-like, more man-like, that that sensitive, intuitive part of Josephine, the woman, got lost, right? Until I had a really hateful encounter in the workplace, literally brought me to my knees and I realized, wait a minute, there's value in having those girl sensitivities, those female sensitivities, that intuition that would have allowed me to see that encounter coming a mile away, but I didn't because I was behaving like a man, right? I was gonna go in and have this conversation and it blindsided me. So, and Doug and I have talked about that. And that was eye-opening for him in that he had coached me all the way to the other end. So I had to find the middle and the middle is act like a man when I need to, right? And that's just being real about it. But don't lose Josephine. Continue to be who I am. And you know what? I've cried in the office. I remember my grandmother saying, you never cry at the workplace. Well, guess what? I'm sensitive. So yeah, I've cried. Did I think it would ruin my career? I did. Did I talk things through? You know, after that happened? Absolutely. But I am who I am and I don't apologize for it. And I think that's the difference that I've arrived at that point that I don't apologize for who I am. And I also understand that there are differences, but I try not to get lost. Does that make sense? It does. Mm -hmm. I think that's one, you know, like that, that is definitely a struggle. And I think that's why, you know, having everyone included in these kind of conversations it's just super important. I'm sure guys feel the same way and, you know, or you know, have, have their own kind of, things or or whatever and and having those conversations in a in a in a in a setting like this and stacy i agree i mean we have a we have a long ways to go right and, and kelly we have to create an environment where you can feel free to speak up and not get a label on your on your head um we have a long ways to go but um i i think having open dialogue like this in a in a diverse group um, mm -hmm. you know, is this is a step in the right direction. And I think that's what made the difference for me. I think had Doug been a woman, right? And in my case, a black woman, we would have commiserated about the same things and, and maybe gotten stuck. You know, yes, it is happening because you're black. It is happening because you're a woman. And I don't think I would have ever gotten unstuck. I would never have realized that I had a chip on my shoulder. So for me, it was important to have someone totally different, totally the opposite of me, to put that in my face. Because I think otherwise it would have just been, oh, this is who I am. This is how I am and like it or lump it. And this is the way I'm going to walk through the world. And it's okay. And again, I found that, yeah, it is okay in its place. 
but I did need to change some things so that I could walk through the work world differently. Absolutely. So guys, we are at time today. So Josephine, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank it was you. an exceptional speech. And, you know, it really had me questioning, you know, what implicit biases do I have? How can I become a better ally? And most importantly, you know, what role can we play uh, to create a culture that allows diverse individuals and perspectives to flourish? Um, so, you know, guys, if you are not a member of the Wernicke Women's Inclusion Network, we encourage you to join our channel and teams. It is available for everybody. Um, and it is not just the girls group. So feel free to join. Um, and we hope that you guys enjoyed our session today. Uh, we have another session on April 21st, where we'll delve a little bit deeper into allyship and diversity with TEDx speaker, Julie Kratz. We hope to see you then. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks.